start and we'll go live. Okay, folks, good evening and thanks so much for joining us for our student life and well-being panel. This community panel is going to feature a lot of different aspects of the EPS experience. We've had other panels talking about our academic design and how our curriculum works and how the independent curriculum works. This panel is really focused on all aspects of the student experience that pertain to how we help students to experience a sense of belonging, a sense of fun and adventure, a sense of being able to connect with one another outside of class, as well as to a certain extent, some of the experiences that they'll have inside class. And you have a packed lineup of amazing community members who are going to be able to talk about their experiences. We will introduce them in just a moment. Just a couple of housekeeping items as we get started. You have a live event Q&A where you can be able to add questions in for our panelists. It is great if you include your name. You can also ask questions anonymously. So choose the best choice for you and your family as you enter that Q&A. We will answer questions as we go through the evening. So feel free to start adding some in now, or you may think of things as our panelists take the opportunity to share information with you. Um, we are going to have a runtime until 7.30 p.m. this evening, an hour and a half runtime. And so we look forward to any and all questions that you want to send through in that time. And if there's anything that we don't get to, we'll be sure to answer those pieces offline as well. Um, we will have upcoming community panels beyond this one. And I want to highlight that we have our previous community panels highlighted on our webpage. The videos are all there. So if there's anything that you missed already in this series and you want to see, we certainly welcome you to take advantage of the recorded versions of those panels that are up. So we are so pleased to introduce you to everyone, but let me start by introducing myself. My name is Cheryl Shank Miller. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management at Eastside Prep, and your event tonight is being produced by our admissions event coordinator. That's Meg Blyler. And so Meg will be behind the scenes ensuring the production of tonight's event. Also, you are joined by, as I said, so many different folks from the EPS Canvas community, colleagues of mine from our senior leadership team, faculty members, and most importantly, and most popularly at these panels, our students. So we will go in order of EPS experience as far as the student introductions and continue down the list from there. I'm really excited to um, have our first panelist kick it off because this is a student who I got to experience experiential education with this past spring uh, when we were backpacking on the Olympic Peninsula together. So Anderson, how are you this evening? Uh, I'm doing great, how are you? I'm doing well. Anderson, can you tell us your class year and some things you're involved in at EPS? Uh, so I'm the class of 2023, so that makes me a junior this year. Um, some of the things I do at school, I'm a part of the peer mentorship program, so uh, I do different uh, activities with advisors, uh, advisories in the sixth grade, um, and I'm looking towards joining the climbing club this w coming winter. Nice. All right, so peer mentorship and looking forward to doing some climbing. Sounds great, Anderson. Next, we have Aria. Hi. How are you this evening, Aria? Uh, I'm great. I'm doing really well. Awesome. Will you tell us your class year and some of the things you're involved in at EPS? I am class of 2025, so ninth grade, and I'm on the math team. I do chamber choir, which is really fun, and I'm in Allies for Equity. Great. And Allies for Equity, is that a club that meets during the day? Yeah. Okay, cool. During the school day. Wonderful. Aria, thanks so much for being here. We're glad you're here. Um, so representing the middle school, we have Sanjana. Um, hi, um, I'm class of 2029, so I'm in fifth grade, and what I really like that I'm doing in EPS currently is debate, which meets doing middle band, and um, Lego robotics, which I also really like, which is also a curriculum that's after school. Great. All right. So Lego uh, robotics happening after school and then debate meeting during the middle of the school day. Thanks so much for being here, Sanjana. David Kelly Hedrick, how are you this evening? Good evening, Cheryl, and good evening, everyone. I'm doing wonderful. Uh, I'm David Kelly Hedrick. I'm uh, English faculty. I teach eighth grade literary thinking three. So I teach all the sections of eighth grade literature 
And I'm also the experiential education coordinator overseeing our outdoor education programs, our experience beyond the classroom week in the spring and our fall orientations and a kind of a whole smattering of activities and uh, outdoor adventure excursions that we run throughout the year. Sweet, and David, what kind of outdoor adventure excursion do you have represented in the background behind you? I'm dreaming of the Southwest Canyonland country right now where there's blue skies and maybe some sunshine. So uh, we often take a, a group of students down there in the spring to go uh, backpacking or canyoneering. And it's really just a wonderful place to uh, explore and hang out and, and uh, play on the rocks, Anderson. So maybe you can do that this spring. Awesome. Thanks so much, DKH. Ed Castro, how are you this evening? I am well. I am I am doing, uh, what's the right word? Uh, fantastic? I don't know. Fantastic. I haven't had dinner yet, but that's coming. <laughs> and that's coming. Ed, did I get the letters behind your name correct? DMA, did I get that correct? Yeah. You have do doctor uh, of something. Doctor, doctorate of musical arts, or as we like to say, uh, don't mean a thing degree um but that's that's ne neither here nor there i'm also i'm also the uh equity inclusion and compassionate leadership co-coordinator along with uh miss bess mckinney who is unfortunately ill today it's taken ill uh but the two of us are uh we do a bunch of different things i think um uh we try our best to uh, ensure that um, students and families and faculty feel um, that EPS is a safe and supportive community. Uh, we're also like working really hard to, you know, build community and and kind of and get everyone feeling a sense of belonging to to EPS and all the different aspects of um, of who they are showing up at on our in and around our campus uh, in a safe and uh awesome way i mean i don't know how else to explain it but yeah that's kind of what we do in the in the um, e eicl office it's an office i can't, can't remember if we're calling it an office or like a yeah we're gonna call it an office okay yeah the eicl zone the eicl experience the eicl i mean we don't have departments at eps right, right? that's what i'm saying plans literacies experiences so mm. Just the EICL awesomeness is, is what yeah. I have in mind. Um, yeah, there we go. Well. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Ed, thanks so much for being here this evening. Dr. Castro, we appreciate you. Um, Ginger Ellingson, my colleague from Fine and Performing Arts, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, nice to see everybody this evening. My name is Ginger Ellingson, and I teach choir at EPS. I also uh, am the director of Fine and Performing Arts, so I get to help organize and facilitate uh, the art experience for students on campus. Sweet. Yeah. Um, Ginger, thanks so much for uh, being here. I know we're probably going to get a lot of questions related to fine and performing arts in both a extracurricular and probably a co-curricular capacity. Just really quickly while you are here introducing yourself, can you also introduce the uh, performance that we're having coming up this uh, at the end of this week? Absolutely. We are so excited to welcome back an audience in person to our Tally Theater, which you can see pictured behind me here. Uh, it's been so wonderful to be back in the space rehearsing. We are going to be welcoming our audience to the opening night tomorrow of Revenge of the Space Pandas or Binky Redditch and the Two Speed Clock. This is a play by David Mamet. It is whimsical and fun and creative and funny, and we have a cast of 19 fifth through eighth graders who will be putting on this show. Um, so uh, their open dress rehearsal is actually just probably wrapping up right now. It was at 5 p.m. this evening. So our faculty are attending that as we speak, and we are going to be having family and friends of the, the cast and the EPS community starting tomorrow through Saturday. Sweet. So unfortunately, this production is not open to the wider community yet, just folks who are already connected to EPS. Is that right, Ginger? Yeah, family and friends of our EPS community. 
OK, great. So we'll look forward to opening up to a wider audience again in the future, as we have loved doing in the past. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to welcome Kim Ang from the athletic side of the house. Good evening, everyone. Uh, DKH, you might dream of being in the sun in the mountains. I dream of being in a gymnasium. So here I am uh, with the EPS gym behind me. I'm, I'm excited to be here tonight to share information about our athletics program, um, anything you want to know about our physical education program. Uh, my job is I'm the director of athletics. I organize our sports. I support our athletes. I cheer them on. I hang out with parents on the sidelines and uh, sometimes even faculty compete against students and uh, faculty athlete games. So I'm um, excited to be here and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kim, for being part of the panel. And last, but most certainly not least, my colleague, Paul Hagen, the, the man that actually has well-being in his title. How are you, Paul? I am doing quite well this evening. Good to see you, Cheryl, um, and uh, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here this evening. I'm Paul Hagen. I'm the Director of Student Wellbeing, um, which actually means a lot of things at Eastside Prep. Uh, I certainly work with our school counselors and our Director of Health Services. I also work with our um, student Life Coordinator, thinking about clubs and activities and uh, uh, social events. We think of that as a part of well-being, sort of the social well-being of our student population. And I work with David Kelly Hedrick and really everybody on this call um, as we uh, welcome students into our community and make sure, as it has already been said, that this is a safe and welcoming community for all and that all students will be able to um, truly be themselves and find their interests and passions here at Eastside Prep and get the support they need uh, when they need it. Um, I'm sort of, uh, you know, everybody has these really great backgrounds of the gym or great outdoor <laughs> places. I'm not sure what my background, I guess I could have done a background in my office, but I, I don't think anybody really wants to see my office. It's, it's sort of a mess these days, so. It's okay, Paul, and uh, and you know I always think of your office as just the Lavender Pool Commons. Or yeah, it's commons sort of everywhere. Yeah, general, <laughs> like you're kind of everywhere in there. I see you around so many different aspects of campus. So uh, we will we will uh, give you a pass on the the background mojo tonight. No worries there. Um, well, I'm hopeful that our students can actually get us started with a first question um, because one of the things that Mr. Hagen was talking about, folks, was this whole idea of students experiencing the sense of being able to be themselves at EPS. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to in your own experience, whether that's months that you've had at EPS or years that you've had at EPS, um, if you can think of either a moment where you really felt like, yeah, I really feel like I'm able to, to be myself here, um, or just an experience that made you feel like, wow, this is really helping me connect with who I am or who I want to be. So. Uh, anything that comes to mind in terms of a moment where you really feel like this this was a time that I was able to really connect with that sense of authenticity. Um, and Arya, I'm wondering if you can kick it off for us um, and then we'll move to Anderson and then Sanjana. Uh, sure. I've had a lot of them, but I think for me it would be the eighth grade EBC trip. A handful of us went to the Cascades and well, there was, let's put it this way, there was a lot of hiking involved and I am not the most athletically gifted human being on the planet, but there were people who would, are very athletically gifted who I'm friends with and they would just sort of stay behind with me while I struggled up the mountain and just keep talking to me and encouraging me. And that made me feel like I didn't have to be good at everything. I would still have people supporting me no matter what I was doing there, which is kind of cheesy, but that's just like the general vibe I always get from my grade and the school. So that's probably one of my top three life moments. That is so wonderful to hear. And yeah, I've been the one uh, at the back of the pack on a school hiking trip before as uh, DKH who hiked up Cougar Mountain with me will attest. So there's uh, there's definitely nothing wrong with that and great to feel that support um, from the folks you're with. So really appreciate that story, Aria. And that was from our Education Beyond the Classroom trip this past spring, yeah? Yep. Awesome. All right, Anderson, what would you share in terms of a moment feeling that sense of authenticity at EPS? 
Um, I think that one that really struck me was uh, this was eighth grade EBC. So this was how many years ago? Th four, almost four. Wow. OK, but almost four years ago, I went to DC for our um, our like our one of our UC trips. And on that trip, I remember just spending a lot of time with uh, my teachers. But I think I had Dr. Reyna and Miss Dodd on that trip. And just kind of spending time with those teachers and also uh, connecting with some friends who are even no longer at the school. And I think kind of spending that time with community while going to all these places we went to, like, where did we even go? We went to, I don't know, we went to, we went to all these different places. I don't even remember, honestly, all these museums and places we visited. And we uh, met with it. We, we had um, some opportunities with senators and different people who represented our state in DC. And I think kind of learning about that was an interesting kind of like stepping stone as we go into kind of learning more about that. I, I kind of do that more now in my history class. And so that was just kind of a really fun experience that I had. Great. Yeah. So yet now that you're taking uh, American history, U.S. history in the 11th grade, which is part of our 11th grade sequence, it sounds like connecting back to some of the things that you were doing on that eighth grade EBC trip. Yeah, it was really fun. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thanks for that, Anderson. And Sanjana, can you help us with um, a time even in the few months that you've been at EPS that you've been able to experience that sense of authenticity? So a few months ago, there was a fall orientation week when fifth graders were at EPS and they went to uh, like sort of a park to do like certain activities that the advisors hosted. So some of the activities were a little challenging and they took more time than others because other advisors maybe were more faster than us. And we sort of felt, I don't know, that we couldn't do it, but everyone encouraged each other. And in the end, we did take a while to do like some certain activities, but we still did it. So yeah, that's what I liked about our advisor. So fall orientation sounds like some great experiences um, and some bonding with your advisory group is one of the things that I'm hearing there. And Sanjana, I want to stick with you um, for this next question because we did get a question in the chat um, asking us to describe the community and what it's like coming into Eastside Prep as a ninth grader. Um, obviously, you can't speak to that experience, but can you talk about coming in as a fifth grader? Um, and then I'm hoping we can hear um, from some other folks about maybe some of these fall orientation experiences and other programs that we do to help bring students together um, in their different grade cohorts. So Sanjana, tell us about you know, if you could just pick a couple of words maybe to describe the EPS community to start and then so, what's it to come in as a new student. A couple of words to describe the community is it's very friendly and kind and all the teachers and students have a nice relationship with each other and they can sort of just talk to them freely as friends, not just like as teachers, but like they can get to know them. And it's great to be an EPS student because being new means you can make a lot of friends and not just students, it's also really important for students and teachers to get to know each other. Mm. Okay, yeah, so it's not just the student community, it's also the teachers. Um, Aria, it's been a while since you were a new student at EPS, but can you talk about now being a ninth grader and having a mixture of both new and returning students in your class and some of the ways that maybe you're connecting with those who are new to EPS and, and what are some aspects of that that you recognize as somebody who's been part of the community already? I mean, at first, when I was in eighth grade and I heard that like half the grade would be full of new people, I was very nervous and also very excited to meet new people. I think what was nice about it is that some of us were there in middle school, yes, but high school was a new thing for everyone. So we really just sort of learned to rely on each other really fast because yeah, it is tough. You're coming into like a new stage of education. You're coming into like a new part of the school. So all of us sort of latched on to that. What would the word be? That difference sort of experience that we were having and like the new aspects of what we were feeling and we found comfort in other people who were feeling that way too. And we just sort of came together and clicked really well. That's great to hear. Um, and then anyone else who wants to contribute some some of these programmatic elements of how we're bringing students together when they're new or any other thoughts about incorporating um, students into our community or really anyone who wants to add something about the community. Ginger, I see you're unmuted. Was there something that you wanted to add? Uh, you know, 
programmatically, I think we we have pro, we have opportunities designed specifically to incorporate students. The fall orientations historically have been a wonderful opportunity to get off campus and uh, have the students meet each other and the faculty. Uh, we also have our advisor at our advisory program where the students will integrate with one another and get to know a teacher well, and they stay with their advisories for the whole year. Um, but in you know my what I actually started thinking of is just the intention with which uh, teachers approach the beginning of their courses. We all take the time to get to know our students new and returning because in the fall everyone kind of feels new again it's a new beginning for everybody and we take the time to build relationships with them because it makes it a more worthwhile experience and, uh, and school year for everyone but also because it actually allows learning to happen once you are in relationship with your student and the students are in relationship with one another true learning can actually begin and it's just a better experience for everybody. So, so it, it, it this idea of incorporating uh, new students into the community and the com the student community with the adult community happens programmatically. It also happens in the classroom. Um, or you know, we have extended passing periods where we're checking in with one another and lunchtime, and it's just really ingrained in our approach to education at EPS. Awesome. Thanks, Ginger, for adding that. Any other thoughts that folks want to add? Feel free to just unmute and contribute. One thing that I hear from EPS students oftentimes is just the sense of like, I can't really remember who's new and who's returning at a certain point in the year. And that's that's always our goal um, through these programs that the students who are new to the EPS community are not going to feel new for very long and that we really know that the students themselves who are continuing on EPS are are the biggest transmitters of our school culture to one another so it's a it's an important aspect of of who we are um, that we we communicate culture internally uh, rather than dictating it um, to our new students so we've got a couple questions for specific students. So Finn is asking, um, Finn and Mariska are asking, for Aria, could you describe a little bit about the Equity Club, Allies for Equity? Um, what activities do you do? What topics are being discussed in the meetings? And what are your goals as a club? So um, can you just talk a little bit about some of those experiences, how and when you're meeting, and um, maybe some other aspects of what it's like to be engaged in Allies for Equity? Oh yeah, sure. So we meet twice a week on once on lunch during Tuesdays and then during middle band on Fridays. And the ultimate goal is EPS is already a really inclusive place. We want to be able to make it even more so so that everyone can be like super comfortable and we can keep that sense of everyone being able to be who they are without judgment. Um, we're also trying to raise conversations about things like gender inequality, racial discrimination, just general ideas of, well, inequity so that we can fight them because obviously everything starts with a conversation and acknowledgement of the problem. So I think currently we have three things in the mix. First, we're just talking a lot about these topics. Second, we're planning a movie night uh, for In the Heights because a, we'd like to like talk about the culture and things like that. And then also there was a little bit of a controversy with that movie on how there was just some racial controversy. So we want to be able to discuss that after the movie night with people who attend. And we're also planning a culture night, which I am really looking forward to and think of, it will be really fun. It's one of my favorite clubs I've ever done, like ever. I love it. And you've been involved in a lot of clubs having gone through the the whole EPS middle school experience. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and if anybody was involved in Culture Night this past year and wants to speak to, uh, we had our first Culture Night this past year and um, maybe, you know, with the remote format, we're going to see some shifts to being able to do some events in person this year. But um, if anybody wants to unmute and share a little bit about Culture Night, um, that would be great too. Go ahead, I, think I, I think I want to jump in a little bit uh, Go for it. and kind of jump uh, piggyback on some of the stuff I was saying about um, uh, Allies for Equity. Uh, that club is 
primarily student run. So like all of the energy is coming from the students. So that's like that's like a big, big plus for for that group. Um, and the reason we even had a culture night last year, last school year was because the students were so animate about making sure uh, to build community and, you know, highlight different aspects of of uh, of cultures that are represented on campus. So, I, you know, it's like huge, huge uh, kudos to them. Uh, secondly, about Culture Night, um, that I think Allies for Equity did a really good job of understanding that and explaining that one, uh, it, it's not necessary for someone to explain an entire culture to the EPS community, but to explain kind of their identity and their relationship to the culture they're from or the culture that they represent and bring in and illuminating that for the EPS community. And I thought that was really cool uh, when we had several cultures, several um, ethnicities represented by different families and we saw different aspects of those of those cultures, uh, whether they were religion or ethnic or uh, regional like it was really cool to really kind of see like hear different different uh, identities from a uh, very personal perspective. Awesome thanks for providing more context on culture night Dr. Castro and giving a sense for how this like so many different things at EPS is uh, really a student driven program and um, really about that student enthusiasm for what we're doing. Um, that's how so many of our clubs, especially the ones that meet during the day, um, are organized, but also the ones that are after school. And so Sanjana, we have a specific um, after school activity question for you, which is, could you talk about um, what's happening in Lego Robotics and maybe a typical day? Um, how often are you meeting? What are some things that you're doing? Is it about your own project and ideas or um, some group initiatives that you're working towards? What would you like to share about that? So Lego Robotics meets um, two times a week. It sort of depends on like which day and it's taught by like maybe like one teacher and it's basically when students work as teams and students go to competitions in the end so they would build legos and, and make a robot and then learn to program it with coding and um yeah it's very open and students can just share their ideas they don't have to feel enclosed and it's all about learning teamwork Sweet. So can you give me an example of what it was like to maybe share an idea recently and how that was received? Like how many people are you working with? How how much how much are you sharing and with what size group? So usually the groups are about like three to four people and you can choose your own groups because this is like a very free group and a typical day, a project that we're making right now is we're actually sort of building like not really a Lego city, but we're taking robots that are already sort of Lego made and we're coding them using a website. Sounds like that. And then Aria, do I have it correct that you were part of Lego Robotics when you were a middle school student? I was for three years. <laughs> Anything that you want to add about the program for uh, those three years of your life? Well, it, w it was an amazing experience. Um, our team was very interesting. And that at the beginning, we didn't really know each other that well at all, because at the time we weren't choosing teams, we were put into teams. Somehow we just like really, really clicked together. Like it wasn't even a team thing at that point. It was just like us FaceTiming each other on, on like Wednesday nights and talking to each other. And we stayed together over the course of three years. And we learned a lot about obviously Lego robotics, robotics programming and STEM. We also just learned a lot about teamwork and I don't know if they're still doing it through FLO, but if they are, then they have like these core values that they call them. And we just learned a lot about interacting with each other. And oh gosh, the girls on that team are still some of my best friends to this day. So Lego Robotics was such a good time. 
Awesome. I love it. So going from perfect strangers to really close with one another, it sounds like over the course of that time and um, really great to hear that. And I know that there's a lot of bonding that can happen within a variety of programs at EPS. And one of them is certainly music. Um, we already heard Ari mention uh, doing our chamber choir that happens at the beginning of the day. Um, but we have a question for Dr. Castro and Ms. Ellingson. Would you would you talk a little bit about orchestra and band uh, add-ins and notes about choir as well? Um, what kind of repertoire are you playing? And um, also, do we do any competitive or off-campus experiences? So are there ever times that we are engaging beyond the EPS community in a performance or competition mode? Um, I can jump in on the instrumental music side. Um, we don't, uh, to answer that question about competitions, and um, we don't typically do competitive or orchestral festivals. We most, uh, if we go off campus, it's to do like solo and ensemble, uh, more of a, in a individual or small group achievement type situations. Uh, and the repertoire is, uh, now pivoting to the repertoire question, it varies. I try to stay loose with the repertoire. I want to hit some traditional orchestral symphonic sounds and uh, what would be part of the orchestral canons. Uh, you know, the typical names like Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, uh, Handel, Mendelssohn, the, you know, romantic composers. And I also try to include and expand the repertoire to include groups like Radiohead. Uh, currently, we're looking at new composer, a new composer named uh, Marcus Norris, uh, who's an African-American man who kind of does a, a stripped down version of a uh, like a lo-fi hip hop version for orchestral instruments. And looking in uh, Motown things with uh, Marvin Gaye's going on. And yeah, we're kind of, and we've done some jazz in the past and eventually, and this will be the, the perfect segue to talking about um, what happens in the choral side with Miss Ellingson and Mr. Stromberg. Uh, oftentimes the orchestra will get the opportunity to play, to do either chamber music as accompaniment for the choir or uh, vocal ensembles, or we do typically a large scale um, piece to end most of our concerts where the orchestra and the choir sing, uh, sing and play together. Yeah, so I'll pick it up from there. Um, you can tell from how Dr. Castro wrapped up his segment that we love collaborating with one another and we seek out as many opportunities to do that as possible. So uh, we have done a whole unit with our middle school on Stevie Wonder, where the band played um, the band music and the choir learned all the lyrics. Um, this trimester, we're doing a little bit of the history of rock and roll. Uh, and so the middle school choir, for example, is singing the fourth movement from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is the Ode to Joy melody. And um, and then we are transitioning through kind of some some a gospel rock and roll transition, um, uh, of a little song called Up Above My Head, and then doing a few songs by Chuck Berry, one of them being Roll Over Beethoven. So we kind of had fun. I had a lot of fun programming and thinking about the history of music represented in like five little short songs right there. Um, uh, the Advanced Ensemble, which is open to ninth through 12th grade, has a, a similar approach to Dr. Castro's with the caveat that a lot of the more uh, traditional huge symphonic works we can't do um, just because of our numbers. Um, but we, Similar to what Dr. Castro described, we do try to include a lot of traditional music as well as modern compositions from living composers and folk music from around the world. Um, we try to have a variety of cultures represented in our program, languages represented in our program, time periods, uh, tone quality. So I love I love experimenting with 
how to produce sound. Uh, that's something that we focus on quite a bit in my classes so that we have we have an appropriate sound that matches the type of music that we're trying to sing. Um, we've also done some plenty of pop and Broadway um, and some movie music as well. The, uh, the piece that we're working on right now in combination with the orchestra is from the musical Ragtime called Make Them Hear You. So I hope that helps to answer your question. Oh, yeah. oh and, and there's ahead. there's probably one more thing. Uh, uh, Ms. Ellingson, could you like expound a little bit about some of the stuff that the choir has done off campus? Oh yeah, thank you for reminding me. Um, I think, because I think it's really cool. Yeah, we had the opportunity, like the highlight of our off-campus gigs were, were was to sing in um, the uh, ballet by Mark Morris, the Mark Morris Dance Group came to me eventually. Um, we got to perform in their run at the Paramount Theater in December of 2019. So we, I think we had five performances uh, with the professional Mark Morris Orchestra uh, in the Paramount Theater and um, doing the Tchaikovsky Nutcracker score. And it was uh, really fun to be downtown in the, the middle of the fe holiday festivities and when work on a real piece of music with pro professional conductor and a professional orchestra. We've also sang the national anthem at a UW Huskies basketball game. We sang, um, we uh, for several years were able to do a festival where we combined with other local private schools and we um, hired a, a clinician to work with our choirs and then put on a concert in the evening. So all of that programming was suspended over COVID and we are looking forward to bringing it back. Sweet. And you're looking forward to having it back. And before we move on from the performing arts aspect of the program, um, how, we have a question about how does the performing arts program work? Is it open to all students? Are there formal auditions? So um, can we talk about that aspect of being involved in performing arts and both the orchestra and um, choral music, uh, or excuse me, uh, you know, instrumental and choral music, as well as theatrical performance? That'd be great, Ginger. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we it's really important to us that we both have opportunities for novices to uh, have some introductory experiences in all of the art courses at school and the art experiences at school, as well as uh, opportunities for students who already have built a foundation of, of skill and knowledge to deepen their skill level, to deepen their uh, experience on the stage and, and making music or acting. Uh, so depending on how you come to us, we will work with you to find the right fit in our program. Sometimes it includes a little check-in at the beginning of the school year. If you're brand new to us, we might wanna sit down with you for 15 minutes and just like chat and maybe make some music to see what, what class might fit you the best. Um, and if you're, you know, for our returning students, usually we have a really good idea about what where they might fit in to the program best. So uh, there's no formal audition. Um, Dr. Castro has often, has also at times had students submit tapes um, or or some segments of recordings so that they can be properly placed. Um, so that's incurred. Our, our after school theater we do have auditions for and we try to include as many students as possible. Usually uh, we can cast anywhere between like 15 and 30 students in a show. Um, uh, sometimes depending on turnout that's everyone that auditions and sometimes we do have to make cuts in that arena. So um, for the most, you know, in, in general, we, we are as inclusive as we possibly can be. And then we have opportunities for beginners, intermediate and advanced level students. Great. And students, if anyone wants to unmute, if there's anything you want to share about performing arts before we move on, it'd be great to hear some of your perspectives on the program. Um, I'll just look to see if anyone unmutes and then we'll move on if there's nothing anyone wants to share right now. Go ahead, Arya. It's just really amazing. Um, I am a human being who deeply values sleep and zero period definitely takes that away, but it's honestly worth it to do choir in the morning and it only, it just makes the rest of my day so much better. So, so you start at 7.30. Love it. Woohoo! So you start at 7.30, go until 8.15. That's four days a week, Arya? Yeah. 
So as a sleep lover, that's a really, really huge commitment. What is it like in the morning? Um, how long do you take to warm up? How long are you actually getting into music that you're working on? I mean, we'll have like our nice check-ins for like five minutes because everyone in the choir, they're just all such lovely people. And it's just, it's a nice little community we have there. And then the rest of it, it's music. It's sometime warming up. And then we work on our pieces for um, the concert. And I think we'll do like fun little rounds sometimes in the morning. So I, I just love it so much. Choir is one of my favorite classes. Sweet. And you're not just saying that because Ms. Ellingson's here. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> she can, if you want to, I don't know, just automatically give me an A for the rest of the year. I won't be opposed to it, to it like at all. So oh, we can just no. go for that. You know, now folks really get to see that, um, at EPS, we're, we're all about making sure that students have the opportunity to leverage their community panel. <laughs> oh, yeah, the system here, the grading Absolutely. system runs entirely on bribery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, well, lest we start any rumors about EPS grading, let's transition to athletics. We've got a great question from Jackie. Um, I see that from the EPS website, there are many athletic programs, um, some that practice during the school day and others that um, maybe have games in the after and have games in the afternoon and others that are practicing in the afternoon. So are these considered for those that practice during the school day, Ms. Eng, um, are these considered part of PE classes or the extracurricular program? Like how does that fit in? Um, and so how does it work to select different sports for PE? And so you can, can you just give us an overview of how this works between sports, PE, and what the requirements will be for students and what the options will be for students? Absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, great question. So the only sports that are offered during the day are for our fifth and sixth graders. So, um, during the fall, they can play volleyball or soccer in the winter basketball and in the spring ultimate frisbee. So during one of our blocks during the school day, that is when your team practices with your coach. Uh, the commitment level then really is just one or two games after school during the week. So that's for the fifth and sixth graders. And then kind of as you move up the ladder, get a little bit older, um, the seventh and eighth graders practice uh, about two days per week after school with uh, a game or two a week. And then when you move on up into the uh, upper school, that's the five day a week, probably three games a week commitment level. So we try to start um, start off with the, uh, with the fifth and sixth graders so the commitment after school time is less so you can do super fun things like Lego robotics and debate and all those fun things you're hearing about and the the after school plays. Um, and then slowly as, uh, as student athletes get older, the commitment level increases. All right, so stepping up that level of commitment is an important thing. And um, and then again, just clarifying those sports that are practiced during the day, that's going to be limited to fifth and sixth grade. Um, but after school practices are then going to step up in terms of middle school and then upper school in terms of level of commitment. And um, Kim, we just headed into our winter season. So can you just give us a quick wrap up of the fall season, maybe some highlights in terms of participation, um, other things that you're proud of on behalf of EPS in terms of the way that sports went for our school this fall? Uh, absolutely. I don't know if we have enough time for me to tell you about all the things I'm so proud about and so excited about, but uh, this fall was awesome. We had record number of students participating. I think our final count was 283 athletes this fall, which is, you know, more than half the school and it was um, awesome. It wasn't just that we were doing uh, well as far as competitive uh, excellence, which we were. Um, we had many, actually every one of our upper school teams made the playoffs and we, uh, our boys ultimate team just on Sunday played in the state championship game against uh, Nathan Hale, which is a big, a big, much bigger school. And it was just an amazing uh, fall for that team and our volleyball team and our soccer teams. They, um, they all just, went deep into playoffs, which was cool. Um, so obviously funning is win or winning is fun. And that's, you know, what a lot of our teams try to do, but that's not everything that EPS sports is about. We have a no cut policy, which is why we have so many kids that are able to play sports. So if you, uh, 
are one of those athletes that wants to play in college or an athlete who's never tried a sport before and think, oh, that looks fun. I've ne never thrown a Frisbee, but I might want to play. Uh, we have a place for those athletes as well. So um, yeah, the fall was amazing. We started a boys golf team for the first time in the history of EPS this year. We had 11 boys golfers and uh, five of those golfers have moved on to districts. And uh, yeah, and we had a cross country runner for the first time make it to the state championships and um, and a tennis player as well. So things uh, have been really fun uh, this fall, including special events like we have this big homecoming event where we rent two fields and have soccer games and ultimate games. We had a taco truck, invite alumni, faculty, you know, just a big community events uh, that take place. So um, it's just been a really busy but super fun fall. It's super fun fall indeed. I had a great time at homecoming and wanted to say thanks again for all of the, the community aspects that were arranged around that day and um, the students who arranged our spirit week and our spirit days. It was really fun to see everything from dress up like a teacher day to pajama day. Um, I think they had a blast with that. And so just to put a finer point on it, Kim, one of the things that you mentioned was really around this no cut philosophy with the sports program. So I know we got a specific question about that in the chat. Um, that we really do encourage students to um, try a variety of different sports, um, really wanting to give them a lot of encouragement through that fifth, sixth program. But all the way through, um, we have student athletes that are trying things out for the first time uh, within our program. So EPS is definitely not a place where you have to have years of experience in order to participate um, in activities widely, but especially when it comes to athletics, I see that um, that come as you are philosophy is definitely a, a thing that's part of the program. Absolutely. That's something that is just, it's amazing. I mean, you know, for example, we've heard a lot about the boys ultimate team, but we had boys who have never thrown a Frisbee before trying out for that team. So we have different levels of uh, varsity, JV, C teams, and especially the fifth and sixth graders, brand new to the sport. I watched so many of the fifth, uh, sixth girls volleyball games, and I swear they had more fun on the sidelines. They all had ribbons in their hair and pom poms, and they were having more fun cheering on the sidelines than playing in the game, I think. But it's, um, yeah, it's just a fun way to get to know your classmates, to bond with different grades, have so much fun. And um, again, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, get out there and do the best we can, but the, sports is so much more about the winning and the losing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely winning and losing is like one small aspect of <laughs> how sports work at EPS. And I think that team spirit is, is a really great one. We have another question about um, folks who are just starting an activity for the first time. And so Sanjana, this question is directed at you. How do you feel in debate club being, you know, a, a younger student or the youngest student there? Um, did you have previous experience? Um, what would you share about just the experience of starting a new activity like debate? So I really like the debate club. It's for actually fifth and sixth graders. So middle schoolers can sort of get to know each other. And um, this club is when like students debate with each other, not by like saying it kindly and making good points. And I really like debate because fifth graders and sixth graders actually debate really well against each other better than just fifth graders against fifth graders because it's sort of like a mix like each team is like sort of required to have some fifth graders and some sixth graders so they can sort of get to know each other and you can also every single time new students come in so it's just an opportunity to meet new students and teachers and learn about new topics. Cool. So it sounds like you definitely felt pretty welcome at the table in terms of joining debate. And also, this is one of many things like those uh, sports that Ms. Eng mentioned, like uh, a lot of the fine and performing arts elective courses that are combined grades five and six. So a lot of the program has combined grade, grades five and six, as well as combined grades seven and eight. Um, one of the things that uh, was asked uh, just a little while ago in the chat was really around these healthy social interactions and how we support and teach them. So we are folks who are we're full of a campus that or we are a campus that is full, I should say, of students who are either already teenagers or in the process of becoming teenagers and dealing with lots of different social dynamics. So um, Mr. Hagan, I'm hoping you can kick us off with this one in terms of what a variety of different forms of support for healthy social interactions look like at EPS. And then if folks want to pop in with specific examples from areas of school life that they're part of, 
I think it'd be great to give some more specificity to how this takes shape within program, not just in certain elements only. So Paul, can you help us with, you know, kind of supporting these healthy social interactions, whether it's, you know, somebody joining a club for the first time or being part of an advisory group or, uh, you know, just moving through the school day? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a really great question. I love it. Um, and we think a lot about how we do this. I mean, one of the reasons that I choose to work in a middle and upper school um, is because we're working on on this all the time, this development. And you know, to me, um, healthy social interactions sort of start with students knowing uh, who they are. And developmentally, we know in the middle school years, especially, we're seeing that develop more and more as students learn what they're passionate about, perhaps just on, as an interest level. Uh, learn what they believe in, you know, how they feel about various things, et cetera. Uh, and so it, it starts from self-awareness and our um, advisory program starts to build that in the middle school and in the upper school uh, to build in that self-awareness, self-understanding. And then the, that, that extends to this community. How do you treat people around you? How do you work with others, uh, et cetera? And so part of our advisory program is SEL, which is social emotional learning. And we have our advisors uh, working with grade level coordinators at each grade level to really think about what's um, grade appropriate, age appropriate for those advisory lessons uh, related to SEL. And then they're working with our, our counselors on that uh, as well. And we're practicing those kinds of positive interactions between, between uh, classmates and peers all the time and with adults. Uh, and so we, we, you know, I think our students get a lot of modeling from the adults in their life at school as well. Um, so there's sort of the structural piece of, of advisory that allows for opportunities for students to learn more and more about that and how they have positive interactions. You know, I will say um, middle and, and high school age students and, and the teen years can be challenging at times. And so there are moments where students need, <coughs> excuse me, additional uh, support um, and where there's conflicts that do develop. And I think one of the things that um, is so important to me when we think about when those conflicts develop for students is that we give it the time that it needs. Um, so often we can rush through a conflict and we actually don't learn from it. We actually just trying to try to sort of <laughs> sweep it away as quickly as possible, whether from a school's perspective or the student's perspective who's in that maybe an unpleasant moment. Um, and so we, we are, are comfortable sitting in the discomfort of, of challenging social circumstances. And we have people on campus who are really good at working with students whether it's a, a conflict in a peer group. Um, our, we have three counselors uh, who, who serve at our school and they work with students through all sorts of uh, social interactions that maybe didn't go uh, as well as they could have. And at times that's bringing a whole group together and working with them through something, or at times it's individually working through students who, who maybe need a little additional support. And then if it ever shifts into more of a discipline issue, um, we have the support of advisors who are there to support the student directly and to say, hey, I'm an advocate for you in this, in this difficult moment. And we have division heads who are working really hard to um, ensure that we are uh, equitable and fair and that we really listen carefully to what's going on and understand the circumstance so we can address it in a, in a meaningful way. So that's a start. I think there's, I mean, Cheryl, you were mentioning like there's a lot of other positive uh, sort of social interactions. I mean, one of the things that we really try to build as a foundation here is respect and empathy. And so we, we have lots of opportunities where that gets taught in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And uh, I think that's a big piece of it. And, and part of that is just getting to know each other. And, you know, some of the activities that our students have described today, uh, you know, whether it's clubs or, or um, athletics or the arts or thing, you know, just things that connect them, you know, our EBC week uh, trips, which David mentioned earlier, or our fall orientations, that's an opportunity to build real meaningful relationship with peers. And that, that, creates a foundation on, on which we can build these positive social interactions. Uh, I'll mention one other piece. Um, our older students in the upper school, 
we um, bring in some guest experts to talk a little bit about healthy relationships in our junior and senior years. If we're thinking about students um, as they're preparing to leave our community and how do we prepare them for those healthy relationships, whether they're friendships or, or more of the romantic relationship uh, variety. So we wanna prepare students for that as well as they're, as they're leaving our campus. Awesome, and Anderson, I'm not sure if you've directly experienced that programming yet, but as our, our most uh, experienced student on the panel, I'm wondering if you can speak to that social piece and maybe um, maybe a lot of this has felt kind of invisible to you in terms of the programming and, and other aspects that are part of advisory, or maybe you want to speak to the experience of being a peer mentor uh, in terms of trying to help uh, some of the middle schoolers as they go through this development, but what would you share from the student side um, with respect to the, these social development pieces? Uh, yeah, I think that definitely speaking of per mentors tomorrow, um, we're going and we're going to be talking about uh, bullying and teasing, and I think that is in conjunction with, um, I think there's a presentation that the counselors are having, uh, I think that was this week or sometime very, very soon. Um, either very soon or so kind of adding on to that and we discussed uh, in our meeting about you know how best to approach you know the sixth grade level of you know what is you know all these different things and they had a had a chart about you know what is like teasing and having fun what is like you know bullying and that sort of thing and so that's definitely a topic that we're going to be addressing as kind of I guess kind of the main portion or a large portion of our advisory time uh, and so that's definitely uh, especially with those peer mentors uh, but yeah I think that with the and then like overall like general like learning like social skills i think that i definitely remember there being a lot of different presentations over the years of like how to do or, like I, just, I think all those through advisories it was definitely always every year there's been not similar programming but you know programming of the same kind of nature of like how do you deal with this sort of thing and how to deal with that sort of thing or like um and sometimes that does involve counselors i remember um, I don't remember specific things that have been discussed, but overall, I think just like that, had the counts. I remember different counselors, and also we definitely, I definitely remember outside people coming in. There's definitely been that, but I also, I honestly don't remember what that kind of occurred until. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of that I think can kind of blur into the overall experience for students over time, but. It sounds like one of the things I'm hearing from you is, you know, from now from the peer mentor side, as you're helping to be part of this programming, um, being very thoughtful about what are some of these topics and the targeted approaches that are going to dovetail your experience as one of the quote unquote big kids at EPS and what you can do as a peer mentor, um, really meshing with maybe some programming that the counselors are going to do in, in a class meeting or an assembly setting. So um, sounds like we can approach these topics from lots of different avenues as well. Um, any other student comments on these pieces? Arya or Sanjana, anything you want to add there? Social development, something that maybe adults think about in a different way than students do. Arya, what would you share? I think advisory is probably just the biggest thing that we've had there for sure. And then also, we just sort of learn to interact with each other in healthy ways through like in class, through discussions, through just working together. We just learn to have good social relationships. So. Excellent. This one to bring um, yeah, so just kind of part of part of how we do things here, just working on on those social relationships. Uh, that's super helpful. So with respect to the um, counselors, we got a specific follow up on that. Is the counselors time shared between the students and are they assigned to a particular grade? Paul, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, we, we've actually talked internally a lot about that. We do not assign counselors to a specific grade level. Our thinking there is that um, we want students to feel comfortable walking into any counselor's office uh, who they may have met uh, on, on an EBC week trip or on a fall orientation or in an advisory session uh, and not feel like they're limited to, to just one of our counselors. We have students who sort of gravitate to one counselor over another based on personality or, 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 or uh, sometimes just availability. And so we want to leave those doors as open as they can for students to access counselors. Uh, I will note um, that this year we've had a counselor who has been positioned closer to middle school classrooms just to be uh, a, a little uh, easier to access from our middle school students. And so 
based on that, I think more of our middle school students have seen that particular counselor just sort of organically. I will also say that our counselors, and this is sort of a unique model, but our counselors are also advisors in their own right. Uh, and we work really hard to make sure that our um, counselors are getting lots of face time with students so that all of our students, whether or not they need that additional support from counselors, um, know who the counselors are, know where they can find them, and know how to contact them should they ever find themselves in a position where they might need a little uh, additional support through the counseling office. So um, that's, uh, we want accessibility to be key there in that program. Great. And Paul, while we have you up, just one more thing that we're going to ask you to tackle. Um, and, you know, knowing that this is a grades 5 through 12 panel, this is going to be a different concern um, at each different developmental level in terms of, uh, do we see any uh, challenges in terms of things like, you know, uh, substance use or any patterns with that in the school community that are worth highlighting? Things that we've tried to, you know, work with students on, um, uh, those behaviors or creating any control in the school community around this? What, is, what does that landscape look like at EPS? We do get this question from time to time. Yeah, it's a great question. We So we, uh, again, working with adolescents at all different developmental levels, we've had to deal with all sorts of things at various points. I will say that um, in terms of things like substance use or abuse, uh, our, we have um, some evidence to suggest that our students have very, you know, we, we have students who don't engage in that behavior, that sort of um, destructive or negative behavior frequently. Um, one of the tools we use to determine that is we have an anonymous student survey that which we conduct annually to get a sense of what our students are feeling uh, about all sorts of different parts of our program. Uh, what, how much stress they're dealing with on the day-to-day -day basis and where what, what might uh, bring that stress about. And it asks our, our older students questions about uh, substance use as well. Um, so we have a sense of, of that and other, um, uh, other topics re regarding health and well-being. Um, and then we also have in the ninth grade, all of our students participate in a health class where we educate directly around uh, you know he healthy lifestyles etc and choices um, so we uh, you know when we have brought in some specific education around I know uh, a few years ago uh, vaping was uh, sort of in society generally was a great concern we you know just generally within the larger um, uh, community in the greater Seattle area and beyond uh, numbers of, of teens vaping uh, was increasing. And so we were worried about our population. We didn't have a lot of evidence that it was that it was happening to any great extent on, um, at school, but we were worried about our community in that way. So we did some programming around that uh, and then and then uh, did some follow up with students to see if you know where we where we had reached them and, and felt that the uh, programming was very effective in just educating students about um, about what was what was going on, what the risks were, et cetera, uh, and partnering with families in that. So when we know of an issue either within our community or just in society, we try to um, address it directly. Uh, with students and we really do view this as a partnership with our students uh, and we talk pretty candidly with students about uh, about all different you know parts of, of life not just academics uh, as well as parents so I think that's uh, that's how we handle those sorts of things. Super helpful, Paul. And Aria, as the student who is enrolled in wellness, PE wellness right now, can you speak a little bit to the content of that class? Um, uh, Mr. Hagen mentioned health as as an aspect of that programming. So, um, what are some what are some things that you've tackled this year in PE wellness that maybe have been meaningful to you, or your your senses they've been meaningful to the the class of students who you're with? Um, well, it's basically just about leading a healthy lifestyle. Our teacher likes to tell us that we're like, yes, education is important, but we also need to know how to live in a healthy manner so that we can really reach our fullest potential. So we've talked about exercise. We've made like our own exercise plans. We've talked about nutrition. Uh, we've discussed sleep. We've discussed mental health. Um, we have talked about drugs and alcohol. And I think since the question was about that, that unit in particular was very helpful because it wasn't just like a 
typical like don't do drugs programming, we learned very extensively about all the different effects it can have on your brain, on your life, scientifically why addiction happens and how to make healthy decisions about saying no to drugs so that we don't end up there. Um, what are we working on right now? We've talked about eating disorders and yeah, I think that's about it. Mm. So it sounds like a really comprehensive, like you said, you know, leading a healthy life. And that can mean lots of different things from that physical, mental, emotional uh, standpoint. So thanks for giving some insights into what you all are doing in that class. And, and we do have a piggyback question, which is around topics of social media use and how those are being discussed in school. So uh, for those who have been on the advising side, um, Paul, I see you're unmuted there. And so is there anything that you want to talk about kind of social media broadly to kick us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll let others jump in because uh, I've taken some airtime. But just just to note that we do some programming specifically in um, uh, in advisory around tech use, and that that means lots of things. So they, for the younger students who may not be on social media as much, we talk uh, a little bit more broadly about it. And then uh, as students get a little older, we run some programming um, a little more specific to social media. Um, and related to that, of course, is uh, online bullying. Uh, and so, you know, we, again, thankfully have not had to deal with this to any great extent, but um, we are very clear about sort of what the what the boundaries are there. And in circumstances where we, you know, where, where there is evidence of that, we um, address it directly. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I don't know if others have more to say on that, but just uh, just wanted that piece to be out there as well. I appreciate that, Paul. So definitely layered into the curriculum there. Um, anybody want to add anything? Feel free to unmute if there's any other comments on social media broadly. Students from the student side, if that's something that you've had conversations about in advisory, anything like that. Everybody's tapped out on their social media use right now. Great, no, no problems there. Um, let's toggle to a little bit more conversation about experiential education. Education, it's experiential education. That's what that's what I'm going to call it now. Um, <laughs> David Kelly Hedrick. Uh, so talking about um, EBC trips, so they usually focus on something specific that students have learned or will learn in the classroom, or are these going to be based on other things? Um, you know, when we're thinking about how the uh, experiential education sh takes shape from a day long experience all the way to these week long education beyond the classroom experiences, um, what can you share in terms of that connection to curriculum? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I would say yes and no. <laughs> sometimes they connect to uh, classes and sometimes they don't. And it's wonderful when uh, they do both of those. Um, for instance, if we have a if we have an EBC trip, we may have one going this year down to El Paso and looking at borderland issues down in uh, El Paso. And that very definitely would c uh, connect to current events and to our, our um, American history and uh, looking locally at those events, but it's also looking at um, what is kind of the history of border issues and how are people, how are people um, living and working along those borderlands, uh, really um, feeling the crunch of those issues of immigrants and refugees wanting to get in and um, trying to deal with, um, you know, a kind of human rights situation. Um, which is a local community situation, but also has um, national and international and global repercussions. Um, so often our, our, I would say the best EBC trips combine two or three or four kind of key topics. They, um, they often in, um, investigate and try and immerse themselves in local culture. I would say food is pretty critical. Everywhere we go, we try and eat local and, and try food trucks and local cafes, whether we're going to Washington, D.C. or to El Paso or doing a college tour down in L.A. or um, if we're down in Canyonlands and we're backpacking and we're learning how to cook in the backcountry and how can we pack healthy food uh, that travels well and doesn't weigh too much. So. 
Anderson isn't completely exhausted when we roll into camp after hiking six miles with our packs. Um, so I think, um, uh, you know, EBC is really pretty wide open and, and I've been kind of trying to organize this program the last three years and we've been dealing with kind of COVID and, and that's kind of changed our focus to like turn locally. And uh, what's wonderful there is uh, we have faculty who have stepped up and say, I have a passion. Uh, someone had a passion for writing and said, I'm going to run a week long Seattle Writers EBC week and tap into my network of writer friends and have them come in and deliver workshops. And it's a chance for somebody in who, who has an interest in creative writing to just really immerse and go deep uh, with that art or that skill. Um, but we're hoping to kind of branch out and go back with some domestic trips this next year in 2022. We've got a drama trip going out to New York City that's really going to dive deep into a number of Broadway shows and kind of combine it with some uh, deep discussion and processing about those plays and do some readings beforehand and, and, and concurrently um, so they can really kind of um, unpack a lot of what's happening there and um, immerse themselves in the theatrical experience. Um, we've got an American West uh, road trip adventure looking at indigenous rights and immigrants in the American West and how our attitudes and um, policies towards land and land ownership and land use in the West have gone through radical changes in you know the 150, 200 years um, previous and and um, are still like being challenged right now. Um, so I think we have a, a, a great mix there of, of uh, EBC trips and we try and capitalize on um, offering a couple of things so that you know when you're going to do something it's going to have some focus and depth to it but it'll also touch in different areas so that you can kind of get a, a broad connection as well. Mm, great to hear it. DKH and um, I know one question that we get pretty frequently from prospective families is around how much choice students have in these EBC experiences. So can you talk a little bit about how that works from grade level to grade level specifically? Sure. Um, typically in the middle school grades five, six and seven, they do a whole class experience. So that's where we want to kind of keep that class uh, together and kind of build on the community and extend the culture that they've established in the classroom during the year. So they are typically going to uh, Northwest destinations as a whole group. Uh, that might be uh, an outdoor camp like Nature Bridge out on the um, Olympic Peninsula. Uh, traditionally, our seventh grade has gone down to Ashland for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and a chance to immerse themselves in some theater down there and just a chance to kind of uh, be a class and take some uh, experiential workshops offered by um, Southern Oregon University. Um, and then in eighth, from between eighth and uh, 12th grade, we start um, offering different choices for uh, students to make. And we uh, we try basically we give choice to um, we give seniority. So we're going to give our seniors the highest pick uh, that they have to uh, that they want to have. Um, but we also ask them to give um, kind of explain why they want to take on a certain EBC experience and um, kind of express themselves there. And we weigh that as well into um, sort of the formula and calculations and and try and figure out, um, you know, what's the best diverse group of, of students and faculty to go and take an experience and how many people can we can we take because those numbers can kind of change and um, we really strive and work hard to give uh, students you know one of their top uh, two or three choices every year and um, and make sure they're they're happy and satisfied with that. Great and uh, and then I did give a little bit of a mention so somebody picked up on this in the Q&A um, EBC opportunities other than EBC week um, and kind of how are those happening throughout the year? And when is EBC week? EBC week is uh, in April. It's mid-April. It's right, it, it abuts against our spring break. 
um, which gives us some leeway to run some longer trips. And when we've done uh, international trips, it gives us a chance to run 10, 12 day trips um, so we can go kind of far. So if we want to immerse ourselves in marine biology and send a group down to the Galapagos, um, that's possible when we can kind of, you know, get down there and have a great trip down there and maximize our time. Um, but know that that trip might go longer into uh, um, into spring break a little bit and families know that ahead of time so they can kind of plan and adjust for it. Um, and then throughout the year we're doing outdoor adventure and trips. We do uh, weekend backpacking trips. We do ski buses. Uh, we do rock climbing club. Uh, we do uh, day hikes. We do snowshoeing hoping to get uh, 30 or 40 students on, and a lot of like first timers up into the mountains to uh, you know figure out how does it work to snowshoe and how do you dress for travel in the winter and, and just make it a kind of a fun and playful day to kind of um, help introduce uh, students who don't have that experience or background um, into the outdoors. Um, I'm actually pretty excited. I think next month we're gonna offer our first squid fishing outing. So we've got um, a faculty member who loves squid fishing and December is just a prime month to get out in Puget Sound and try some squid fishing. Uh, so we're going to be out there a couple nights in December. Um, and to me, that's kind of the magic. It's bringing, finding out what some of our faculty are passionate about. And many of our EBCs are planned, organized and run by faculty. Um, and where they can kind of share their passions on a really deep, immersive level um, and students can can learn and enjoy from that at the same time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those passions are going to be related to things other than what they're teaching uh, on a day to day basis. And uh, and sometimes they are related to what they're doing. So to that end, we got a question of are there STEM related EBC trips? Yes, um, there are STEM related EBCs, humanities related EBCs. Um, there's arts related EBCs. If there's an aspect of our program in and sometimes if there's not, uh, you know, we, we will find ways to incorporate it into education beyond the classroom experiences. So definitely a broad base there. Um, anything else that you would add, DKH, in terms of um, any of these questions that we've had? I know uh, one of them also was, how long is the trip for sixth graders? And uh, yeah, somebody expressing some unfortunate regret that their, their school had canceled overnight um, camps because of the pandemic and, uh, you know, that that students have lost that experience, unfortunately. So, um, so what's the plan for sixth grade this year? And will we be doing overnights as part of EBC this year? We will be doing overnights and, and we're making some adjustments and we've got some new policies we're kind of finalizing right now for kids safety and for family concern, but we're also going to keep um, it's it's a challenge by choice. You opt in if you want to go on the overnight uh, trips. We'll also have uh, an intensive screen printing uh, EBC running on campus during the week. So and we'll have a slew of these local ones. So. Um, um, we do a variety of them. The sixth grade will be overnight. Uh, that will be four days and three nights overnight uh, at a camp. Uh, that's our plan for April. And um, I think our longest right now will be a seven day, but we're staying domestic on all our on, on all our flying travel this year. Yeah, yeah, that is an important thing for safety reasons um, and just logistical reasons that we're staying domestic for now, but hopeful to be international again um, where possible and desirable in the future. So um, thanks, DKH, for all those insights into EBC. Um, would love to hear more about EICL programming. So um, we have a question about wanting to hear more about the specific program that the Equity and Inclusion and Compassionate Leadership Office does uh, to help teach students more about that. So Ed, I'm hoping you can help with that. Um, we also got a question, I think I, if I'm discerning this carefully, one of one of the questions that we have is um, community guidelines toward maybe racial discrimination or, or other aspects of, um, you know, just kind of community norms maybe that are reflected in some of that EICL programming. Uh, I think this, I guess we'll take the, the first question uh, about programming. Uh, well, we've got a few speakers that are coming in and uh, well, uh, for specific events, uh, for large school events, we've got a couple of speakers who will be coming in just to, uh, you know, to work specifically with particular classes. 
So we've got a, um, something in the works with, and this is uh, pretty typical uh, to have a kind of experted, uh, knowledgeable uh, clinicians come in and, and talk with us about uh, the uh, um, African-American uh, experience in folk music and how that relates to spirituals and how that connects to modern music today and uh, some of the stories that are told there and, and uh, identity work that's done through that, the identity work that's done with students through that experience. So we'll, you'll see that. I mean, Anderson, you should be looking forward to that in, your, in the 11th grade curriculum coming up with uh, Dr. Larna Lewis. Um, we've got, you know, a uh, few folks coming in, you know, to speak directly to us, uh, part of panels, uh, former students, and uh, during, to talk with us during assemblies about their experiences, uh, what they what they're doing in their communities now that they're off campus. Um, so th those are the those are kind of like the big pictures, the big picture uh, onesies and twosies, and then the standard things that we do, you know, kind of centered around uh, celebrating cultures on campus. Uh, we just we're. We just had uh, we're part of a speaker series, so we get to we get the opportunity to sit down um, in a virtual setting with uh, you know very really uh, captivating speakers. And last month we we were lucky enough to be part of a community. I got to listen to Yasi Ross uh, talk with us about um, Native American culture. Uh, uh, and the connection to the civil rights movement and some of the work that's happening today. For example, um, the last assembly, I showed an excerpt of that of that talk and it kind of sparked some interest from students. Uh, and we're going to show the entire uh, discussion on Monday. And it's that we're going to have a little cute, you know, just kind of a little quick uh, think, pair, share, kind of, you know, ruminate about what some of the things that Mr. Ross was discussing and, and kind of, you know, be more knowledgeable as a community. So every every couple of months there there's going to be another speaker. And so we're hoping to bring that sort of uh, opportunity for students, student engagement uh, throughout the year. Um, other things that we're doing, um, you know, they're related really to the student interest. Um, so I know that uh, Allies for Equity planning that uh, International Day, uh, International Cultural Night. Um, I know that APIDA is another uh, uh, the another group that another group on campus, another club on campus that really wants to take on how uh, we do uh, Asian American History Month and how we celebrate that and how that's going to show up on campus. So we're working closely with students on on that project and making sure uh, the student voice is really, really represented here. Um, so uh, as far as programming goes, yeah, it, it goes, it's varied. So there's student centered things and there are other things that we want to do in the professional development side for faculty and staff. And then there are things that we want to send out to families as well. So, I mean, it's a multi-pronged uh, setting of events for for the uh, for the year. So that's one question. And the other one I forgot now. That's OK, because uh, that you shared a lot of information just then. <laughs> so the second one is, um, I, I think there was a question asked in the chat around any policies around racial discrimination or you know how are we when we're thinking about the context that we're in where there are you know are certainly a lot of public regional and national as well as international incidents of uh, you know racial discrimination hate speech you know this is something that can deeply affect our students and our, our community broadly so um, what are some ways that we're engaging that conversation within the EPS community um, how are we responding to that type of um of incident whether that's on the eps campus or elsewhere yeah that so the when we hear when we hear about incidents that are involving hate speech on campus 
Uh, like uh, Mr. Hagen had mentioned earlier, we try to we try to open up a dialogue and have a conversation with folks involved in 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 that particular in a particular incident. Um, so we, for me, I, I mean the of the the times that I've been involved in those, it's really a, a, a understanding if it's something that is either misrepresented, um, having a conversation with students about why why certain things are hurtful why it's uh what what's the history behind certain speech why we try not to say these particular things uh there's not been to my knowledge in the past year something that has been overtly uh monumental that uh that we had to have a an assembly to really discuss and really repair but there have been events outside of EPS that have really rocked the community. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of uh, uh, shooting of African American folks around the country and how that impacted the entire country and in in many instances in the entire world. Uh, the slaying of uh, Asian uh, people of Asian descent in Atlanta that really kind of rocked our community. And when those events happened, we tend to have a larger uh, community meeting. Uh, we try we try to have a space for those who are who want to either understand or want to grieve. Try to give everyone a space for that. Uh, when possible, we we even have uh, affinity spaces for during those events so that we can help uh, heal a community uh, when we're in uh, when we're hurting. So that's that's sort of where we that's sort of where we are with specific events and how we deal with specific events. I mean, by and large, uh, I mean, not to not to plug uh, the website, but I think, you know, a lot of what we <clears throat> a lot more specifics uh, can be can be read online on the uh, um, EICL portion of the of the um, school website. Awesome. We've got a we've got a you know our statement affirming black affirming why we what we believe when we say Black Lives Matter. We have definitions for what we believe equity, inclusion, and compassionate leadership are at EPS. And then we've got several examples and some documents and some resources for folks to kind of chew and uh, expand their knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for that, Dr. Castro, that overview and also some insights into whether we're talking about specific things at EPS or this broader context that we're in, ways that we're supporting students and our whole community through what can be really challenging situations. And I think all of this work um, really centers around this, again, this idea of well-being is really all about belonging. It's really all about knowing that we are the, we're seen and heard as the individuals we are with the multiple identities that we each have. And so to really put a bow on this experience this evening, I'm hopeful that we can go around the virtual room and share a way that we feel connected um, within our community, a sense of belonging. Students started us off by talking about this sense of authenticity and, and feeling that at EPS, but maybe within each of your programmatic areas or within each of your experience as students, if you can talk about um, a moment where you felt a sense of connection um, within the EPS community, some sort of way that you you really felt that that nature of community um, come to life for you within EPS. And so I'm hopeful that we can end it out with that. I'll also be um, putting in the chat a link to our community panels recording so that you can access this and other recordings um, that we've already done and future ones as well as seeing the content that's coming up in the days that those will be available. Um, but I'm hopeful that we can go in the order of our original slide. Um, and Anderson, you might be able to kick us off with a, a remembering of a time that you felt connection at EPS? Um, I think one time that's been really, it's kind of still happening, or kind of one that happens to me a lot is, um, I've been here since fifth grade, so I've been here a long time. Um, and so I think seeing teachers or people, or us, well, especially teachers, right? Teachers that I talk, I had in, you know, maybe years past, years prior, you know, maybe three or four years ago, that I can talk to and, and then, you know, we'll have a conversation in the hallway or something like that is really, uh, is really great and I, that really is 
yeah, it's just super important to me. Yeah, so even somebody that you don't have in the classroom anymore, but they know your name, Anderson, they remember things that are important to you and they're checking in with you just in those day-to-day -day ways, just, uh, just walking by one another. That's great to hear. Aria, what would you share in terms of community connection for you at EPS? Uh, this is pretty recent, actually, and it happened in class. We had our Harkness discussion in Lit, and we've had like a lot of discussions over the year, but that particular one discussion, we all just played off of each other and each other's ideas so well, and I felt like I was surrounded by people who were like, they were like on the same level as me. Like intellectually, these were people who were challenging me and teaching me and helping me grow. So that was a really nice moment for me. Mm. And uh, Aria, a Harkness discussion, can you just define that a little bit for our audience? Oh yeah, basically the teacher doesn't intervene. We've just all got ourselves in our notes. And I think sometimes you can do it with hand raising, we don't, but it's basically a free for all where we have a discussion, no hand raising, no teacher, and we just talk to each other about whatever the subject is. It's really nice and really open and everyone gets to share. Great, thanks for that definition and thanks for sharing that sense of community connection that you experienced as a result of that. Sanjana, what would you share in terms of community connection? So one community connection is uh, during passing periods, like when students sort of just get like 15 minutes to uh, sort of walk around. There was this one day where, um, I don't know, everyone was like upstairs and they were all on their laptops and all the teachers were just like sort of, it was sort of like a funny moment, like all the teachers were like all telling the students to like go out for a walk. So I felt really connected because like everyone should like go out for a walk and like not always be on your screens. And it was really funny because me and a couple of people were like the only people who really were doing that. So I think it's really important to still get exercise while like still being on your screens. So I felt really connected on that day because it was really <laughs> funny. That's a great example, Sanjana. And yeah, sometimes it just takes that little nudge to say, hey, what are we all doing on screens right now? Let's let's go outside. Let's go for a walk and remember that, yeah, we're, we're just humans with one another. I know that lunch in middle school is intended to be a laptop free time for that reason. Uh, we uh, have students being in conversation and community with one another because that can be so essential and important. Um, DKH, a moment of connection, what would you share? I would piggyback on what Anderson said. I, um, you know, having been here for seven years and um, he was in a, a outdoor adventure seminar with me this year um, and how wonderful that was for me to have that connection with him from several years ago and and see the kind of change, the level of maturity, the, the deeper huskiness of his voice. <laughs> the swagger he carries around campus uh, is really fun. Um, and to hear him kind of talk about, you know, where where he wants to go in life and some of his uh, his dreams and hopes was uh, super exciting and interesting for me. So um, definitely, I, I echo what he says. I mean, we sit down, we eat lunch with uh, one another, we pass by in campus, we stop and and chat, and and that sense of community is really. Uh, really ever present around the EPS campus and, and really a wonderful aspect of this school. Awesome. Thanks, David. Uh, Dr. Castro, community connection. Yeah, I think um, one of the it's since uh, since I get to conduct um, as a musician, I get to interact with students in that way. I think uh, for me, the the community connection really happens when the class performs, when they, uh, you know, for any, for various reasons. But the one of the ones that comes to mind was, um, I think we, we were doing a, a tribute to Martin Luther King. And there was, uh, we were, the orchestra was performing, the orchestra and the choir, we were both, we were all performing, uh, lift every voice and sing and then segue into we shall overcome uh and just uh with the with an audio of martin luther king in between um and i remember uh students coming up to me and 
uh, parents coming up to me afterwards and just saying, wow, I've, I've never experienced that, uh, that, particular, that particular feeling with these songs. Uh, and to connect them that way um, in concert and in assemblies to have uh, just, you know, students that I've never interacted with come up to me and say, hey, that was really cool. I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, that that was that was kind of special and, and uh, made, gave me a sense of belonging because I knew that it was a whole team effort to make that moment, even if it was for, um, even if it, uh, folks didn't reach out and say, hey, this was cool, like just the, the 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 vibe in the room was was a, one of appreciation and that yeah that sense of belonging like that's why we we do arts mm -hmm. absolutely and such a great connection between your areas here at EPS and I got you know uh, chills it usually has a negative connotation but I got chills just um, thinking back to that moment um, that you were describing it so thanks for sharing that uh, Miss Ellingson Ginger what would you share in terms of that community connection. Um, one thing to add to Dr. Castro's story is that he uh, com composed and arranged that beautiful um, experience for all of us. So he took those two songs and, and put Martin Luther King's speech in the middle of it and, and, uh, co and arranged it for orchestra and choir. So he gets a little credit for that project that brought us all so much community and connection. Um, mine is about faculty connection. We have uh, one period where Dr. Castro and uh, Luke Stromberg, who's another music faculty, and I share a free period. And we happen to uh, go to breakfast and we get delicious food made in our school cafeteria. And we sit down and this time that is was usually just individual planning time it ends up turning into a meeting that is social it is philosophical we we work out nuts and bolts we brainstorm concerts we talk through how our classes are going and uh, it is impromptu and ad hoc but oftentimes take the takes the place of meetings that would otherwise need to be scheduled uh, and I enjoy the social connection and the musical connection and the, the teaching philosoph philosophical connection that I have with both of those faculty members who lift me up and make me a better teacher. Uh, and I just love that it happens organically that way. And and that's it's work and it's really enjoyable. And so thank you to those two and and to mm -hmm. EPS for for the that kind of support and environment that that is created in order to allow that to happen. Mm, absolutely. Something that I would second right there. Kim, what would you share in terms of community connection? Well, I think I'm pretty lucky because I feel like every game or event I attend, I, I feel that community connection. But um, the one that's sticking in my head right now was last Sunday when when our boys ultimate team was in the state championships. I was looking around and I just felt so proud to be in the community and I was connected. We had students there. We had parents there, not even just parents of the team, parents of kids who weren't on the team, lots of faculty there. And it just was super cool. I mean, nearing the end of the game, we there wasn't enough time on the clock for us to win this game. So uh, we were going to uh, be state finalists instead of state champions, but everyone stayed in the stands. They sat there. They were so proud to be an Eagle at that moment. And when the game ended, we saw 28 boys all get together in a circle, put their arms around themselves, and their cheer was one, two, three Eagles, four, five, six family, and they yelled it. And it really felt like we were all just this one big family. So um, that's my most recent memory. That's a pretty awesome moment, Kim. And again, the chills are coming in a good way. <laughs> uh, Paul, to round us out this evening, and thanks so much for our attendees for, for sticking out to hear these great moments. Um, what would you share, Mr. Hagen, in terms of uh, community connection experience? I was thinking just today um, what it would be just from today, and there was there's too many to list, uh, honestly. And I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, 13 years ago when I when I started here, the thing that attracted me to Eastside Prep was the people. I've always said that, um, and that's the students, and it's the faculty and the staff, and it's the parents. Uh, and that has not changed in, in 13 years, uh, even though many things about the school has. And I was thinking about it, you know, it really is that, you know, there is that mutual respect and the empathy for each other and the true care. You know, I can think of today moments where I met with colleagues and just had 
human moments with them that were really meaningful to me. Um, but I think, uh, you know, when I was trying to think about why it's so special, why those relationships are so special. And I think it's that we're all pulling in the same direction. Um, that is that we all believe in the mission of the school and we all care about the vision of, of the school. And we're, we're working hard together um, in partnership with students, faculty, uh, staff, parents to see that mission and vision achieved. And, and so it, it means uh, rich relationships are developed um, with, with that. And you just heard it from this, these panelists are, are all examples of, of that precisely. So I think that's what, where I would leave it um, this evening. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Paul, great note to end on. Thank you so much to every single one of our panelists. Again, to Meg Blyler, our admissions event coordinator for producing this evening's event, and to all of you for participating with your questions. It was great to hear from you. We'll look forward to seeing you at future community panels, hearing more of your questions, seeing you at other events that are coming up as part of the admissions season, and wishing you all the best uh, community connection as you head into the rest of your evening and week, whether it's at EPS or elsewhere. Thanks everyone so much for being here and have a great night. Thanks, Cheryl.